Welcome, we're thrilled to have you, and welcome back to all of those who are returning to a year of courageous conversations in which together we explore how to foster greater inclusion and belonging in our community. I'm Jessica Green, your co-host for the series, and along with Zena Jacques, Claire Nelson, and our Courageous Conversations team, we want to thank you for responding to the call and are honored that you are here. So I already said this, but I'm gonna say it again because it's in my notes and I need to follow them. <laughs> welcome back to those of you who are returning and a warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time in the series. Since our first session in September, we have explored courage and mindfulness. And tonight we will explore what it looks like to cultivate curiosity. All of the sessions in this first half of the series have been designed as our personal preparatory work or the inner work, our inner work that we can call on as we enter into our second half of the series in January, as we explore topics such as understanding privilege, confronting prejudice, and challenging separation. Should anyone wish to watch any of the previous sessions, you can find all of our resources, including videos of the sessions online at courageousconversations.us. Please feel free to share and forward with interested or curious friends, family, and colleagues. On the blog, you will also find updates, suggested links, and readings. And soon, we will have reflections from some of our fellows about their own journeys thus far. Really excited to share those and read those. While we come together each month in community to learn and explore with one another, you will likely find that it is in between the sessions where the true practice of this work is taking place. Maybe you stop to take a deep breath before reacting to something you don't like. Maybe you pause to notice where you are feeling fear in your body. Or maybe you called on your courage to share something you might have otherwise not. Those are the places where the practice is happening. We are videoing tonight, but be assured that your table conversations will remain private, further honoring one another, and in an effort to create space for honest sharing, we ask that as individuals in the room share their stories, please treat the information as sacred, and let it remain with you upon leaving. Thank you. Also, we ask for phones to be switched off or to at least remain on silent as we practice our grounding virtues, which ask us to be present with one another. Producing this series is a true team effort, and we would be remiss not to acknowledge Barrington's White House, Barrington Area Library, Be Strong Together, Barrington Area Community Foundation, BMO Harris Wealth Management, Sue and Rich Padula, Kim Dujaswa, and Urban Consulate for their partnership on this journey. Registration for the 2020 portion of the sessions is open and it's on our website and we hope that you will come along for the entire journey. It goes all the way through June. Um, so we encourage you to please register now before all the seats are taken and if there is a wait list, put your name on the wait list because people are moving around and you might be able to get in. So please be sure to put your name on the wait list. And now to in introduce Aaron Reeves, um, who is our speaker tonight. And Aaron has been with us for the last three sessions, and she has guided our team um, throughout the first half of this series beautifully. Aaron Reeves, PhD, is a leading researcher, author, and advisor in the fields of leadership and inclusion. For over 20 years, she has delivered dynamic and thought-provoking messages to inspire and activate change for audiences across the world. Blending her diverse backgrounds as a lawyer, a researcher, an academic, an author, and a consultant to organizations ranging from Fortune 500 companies to hospitals and governments, she speaks on many forms of difference. She is the best-selling author of three books, The Next IQ, One Size Never Fits All, and Smarter Than a Lie, and she is president of the research and advisory firm, Connections. But before Erin comes on to do the work with us, I would love to introduce our convener in chief, Dr. Reverend Zina Jacques, lead pastor of Barrington's Community Church and co host of this series. She's here to set the stage for our practice tonight. Every once in a while at church, I do a series of sermons based on children's books. This is my favorite. Do you know the Velveteen Rabbit? I think. If you don't know it, the wise voice in this book is the skin horse. He is the oldest toy in the nursery. So old, his fur is worn off, his tail is bare, and um, he looks a little worse for the wear, but his wisdom is sure. There is a bunny, 
a velveteen bunny in the nursery who longs to be real. He has seen bunnies with legs. And he goes to the skin horse and he says, what's real? And the skin horse says, real isn't how you're made. Real is what happens to you after a very long time. Does it hurt? Sometimes. But when you're real, it doesn't matter. Does it happen all at once? No, it doesn't happen all at once. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily, have sharp edges, or have to be carefully kept. This is a journey. It's not going to happen all at once. And it might hurt. We might discover things in our own being that require examination and maybe even transformation. But if you're on your way to being your real self, this real only pretends to who you are. If we are on our way to being our real selves, that pain, that transformation is a part of the growth. You know your bones hurt when you're making white blood cells and they're growing. That's the kind of real we're becoming. But the skin horse's other advice, not quickly. Can't have sharp edges, can't break easily, and can't have to be carefully kept. This book was written in 1922. My brothers and my sisters, my, my, my siblings and my friends, we come to this work with the fullness of desire to be changed. And so we have to be rounded by the rubbing of ideas, rounded like a pebble in a stream that's gotten tossed, but then is able to fly fast and far. We have to be willing to not be carefully kept. We're going to fall. You are going to say something that offends somebody. You're going to make a mistake, as am I. That's okay. Because it's in the authentic exchange that in that not breaking easily, in that resilience, we stand up and we try again. And it's this willingness to come, to come. That means you're not trying to be a porcelain something on a shelf that you're willing not to have to be carefully kept. The skin horse was right. And the last thing I will say is the, the bunny in the story is becoming. I love the part of speech that is a gerund. <laughs> you ha here's how you tell a gerund. It's always got an ING on it. It's always in process. May I submit that none of us will ever arrive at the fullness of this work? None of us will ever have it perfect. And if that's your goal, because we're always becoming, we're always growing. So relax the goal of perfection Relax the need to have it all right. And like the skin horse says, come fully in. Because if you know the end of the story, he hops off on his new legs, having become real. That is the trajectory for each of us. That is the path that we're on. Welcome. The journey is fully underway Amen. together. Hi. Last time I was here, we had a tornado warning. <laughs> I got to know some of y'all really well in the basement. So hello again. Um, Jess and Claire had an interesting observation that many of you here are new today. So can I just see a show of hands if this is your very first session? Woohoo! How about if this is your second session? We're going to clap for everybody. All right. What if this is, if you've been to all three? All right, awesome. 
So um, the, for those of you who haven't been to all three, the very first time we talked about fear, right? And the takeaway from fear is that fear is an unconscious reaction that we have. Um, and we'll sort of review that really quickly, but what, what happens when we are afraid is that our brains get hijacked, right? We start reacting to things. And then what Krista, who's back there, did a fabulous job at the last session is we talked about mindfulness, right? So one of the things that we can control when we're scared is before we react, we can stop and say, what do I wanna do? And in that moment, if you're mindful, you can choose a path that's different than maybe where your brain wants to take you, and I'll review that as well. Today, we're actually gonna talk about curiosity, right? Um, and so since many of you are new, um, and some of you have had conversations, others haven't, I'm actually going to give you a little bit of a curiosity exercise at your table. Here's your job. Okay, do not go beyond your job. All right? Some of you, I have noticed, are overachievers. This is your job. We're going to start with one person at the table, and you're going to go around the table, and you're going to tell people your favorite song. OK? And if you're like, eh, too many, OK. Your favorite band, singer, musician, something, OK? Now here's the curious part. Chances are very high, someone's gonna say something at the table that you've never heard of. And you don't get to ask, wait, who is that? What is that? <laughs> We're just going to spark curiosity and let it sit. So no discussions, no conversations, no commentary. <laughs> Literally, you start with one person and you say, my favorite song is this, or my favorite artist is this, and the next person goes, so this should take 45 seconds to a minute. Okay, so I told you, some of you do not listen to directions. I hear the conversation about this. All right, so um, let's get back together. And very quickly, just raise your hand if you heard a song or an artist or a band that you've never heard of before. Okay. Now I want you to pay attention to that moment when somebody said, this is my favorite song and you've never heard that, right? And you wanted to say, what is that? What does that sound like? Can I hear it? I want you to just hold space for that feeling of wanting to hear more, right? That's what we're gonna really try to spark today. Um, and so it's easy in a situation like where we say, this is my favorite song, for there to be no fear to say, I'm curious, I wanna know more. But we're gonna to try to hold that space, because it's a really fun space, to say, I want to know more, and we're gonna practice it with slightly harder subjects today as well, all right? As always, if you have questions, jump in. Um, I'm very nerdy, you guys know I get into some of the science, and I'll, um, I won't scare anyone with pictures of white rodents today. Uh, <laughs> that has stayed with me, <laughs> deeply scarring moment in my life. Um, but what I would love for you to do is as you're listening, just really jump in if you have any questions. So quick review, fear versus courage. Right, what we talked about last time is you have an emotional stimulus, which means anything that happens in the world, something you see, something you hear, something someone says, just looking at another person has a stimulus and the job of your brain is to send it to the sensory cortex where you make decisions. And the sensory cortex sends something to the amygdala, sends something to the rest of the brain to say, this is what you need to do. This is called the high road, right? This larger arc is called the high road. This is when we get a stimulus and we choose what we want to do. But about 85% of your decisions on a daily basis don't take the high road. They take the low road, right? <laughs> Um, I, didn't, I didn't label it the low road. That is a neuroscience term, literally, <laughs> that people use. Um, so the emotional stimulus, something happens. You see someone, you hear something, um, you think of something, and in less than one second, the low road already sends a message to the amygdala, which is your fear center, to react, right?
And so one of the things that we talked about is we, we can feel when we're taking the low road. We don't always have time to, but the minute you get scared to just stop for one second and say, why am I scared? Where is it in my body? Krista talks a lot about that last time, right? And if you can pause for just a split second, you can then control if you can choose the high road or if you can go the low road, right? So I've, I drove in from Chicago today. I had a lot of low road moments on the drive. <laughs> and I was okay with it. I felt better after cursing at random people. But I also, right, so part of it is I understood where it was coming from. I was frustrated. I don't like traffic. Um, people don't know how to drive. I'm clearly a very good driver, but everybody <laughs> else is terrible. But what happens that is really powerful is once you understand the process, you can say, this is, I'm taking the low road, right? I'm not calling these people and calling them names, right? Hopefully they don't even know, right? But it is, I know I'm taking the low road and I'm okay with it. But maybe in another moment, because I recognize it, I can also stop myself and take the high road. So recognizing this doesn't mean the low road is always bad. And it doesn't mean you have to stop it every time. It just means knowing allows you to choose in a way that not knowing doesn't. And whether it's to have courageous conversations or just to be more human of a human being, you want to always have that choice, right? So I want you to think about something right now. I'm just going to throw race in there. You weren't expecting that. Um, so if I were to tell you right now, I want you to turn to the person next to you. I'm not asking you to. This is hypothetical. Um, if I were to say, turn to the person next to you, right now, have a conversation about race in America today. Right? Just have a no-holds-barred, truthful conversation about race in America today. What would scare you about that? Right? Would it be that um, you would be scared about offending someone? Would you be scared about being vulnerable, maybe? Would you be scared that if someone said something back to you, you're not going to be able to control your violent impulses? Right? Would it be that you actually really like this person, and maybe you're scared that they're going to say something? And you're going to be like, oh my god, I didn't know I didn't like you. Right? <laughs> These are very real things that go through our heads. But these are all fears. They're all fears. And these fears are what prevent these conversations. So I don't want you to talk about race, but I do want you to talk about, um, what I want you to do is turn to your neighbor, not talk about race, but talk about the scary thing about talking about race, right? And so why? Why are you scared about that? And every single one of us is. I'm scared about talking about race sometimes when I don't know someone. Because while I research it, I'm very theoretical about it, right? I have a son who is almost six foot two, um, who's confident borderlining on arrogant. Not borderlining, he's well into arrogant at this point. <laughs> and we live in Chicago, and I am scared to death of him driving, right? Um, and when he was 12, I had to sit down and have the conversation with him that if he's in the car with his white friends, um, never talk to a police officer the way they talk to a police officer. And I'm scared sometimes when I talk about race that if you move it out of the theoretical and you make it personal, that I'm going to break down. Because nothing scares me more than my son out there on the streets of Chicago every single day. right? Um, he has a very diverse group of friends. They talk about race very openly. He's very conscious of it. But I am scared to death every day that someone is going to say something to him. And he's been raised to ask questions, to sort of question reality around him. And he's going to say something. And someone's going to do something. And it's going to be too late to do anything about it. So I'm scared, right? So yeah, I can give lectures on race. But if I had to turn to my neighbor at a table and talk about race, that's what would get my heart beating. So we all have that space in us, and it doesn't, like, whatever race we are, however we deal with race, there is a space that's, that's scary. 
So turn to your neighbor, um, pick the one you like, I guess. <laughs> I just realized, like, I could have said, like, turn to your right. Pick a neighbor, because <laughs> we have two neighbors. And literally just say, this is what scares me about talking about race, and listen to what they have to say about what scares them about talking about race. All right, so a quick review of mindfulness, um, what Krista talked about last time. She had this quote up, which was really powerful, right? But this is what happens on that low road, is um, between stimulus and response. Do you guys remember her talking about that last time? So between stimulus and how you respond, there is this split second. And you choose what you do. That is all the goal of all of this, the journey, is about choosing in that moment of what you want to do. So the, um, we're going to talk a little bit about how that works. But I want you to start thinking about, don't talk to anybody. This is sort of private thoughts here. Um, but start thinking about a courageous conversation you want to have with someone in your life right now. We all have courageous conversations we want to have that we're putting off because we don't have the courage to have them, thus it's a courageous conversation. But think, and how would you feel if I walked up to you and I said, you have to do it today? I recognize I have no power to make you do that. We're just pretending. Um, but if you had to have this courageous conversation today and I was going to force you to do it, just think about it. And when Krista talked about last time, think about where that's sitting in your body. What tensed? Was it your shoulders? Was it your neck? Did your stomach clench? Did you hold your breath for a second as you were imagining it? Right? Where did it sit as you thought about this conversation? And now I want you to do something she asked you to do last time. It's just scan your body, right? Start with your feet and just say, what part tensed up? Or picture yourself having this conversation. And as you go through your body, just pay attention to what part of your body is like responding to that and is telling you, I want to do this, right? Did your legs start shaking? Did your hands kind of clench into fists? Did your mouth clench? Did your, fa like, did your face clench, right? What exactly happened? And so now I want you to close your eyes. Um, and for, for this, um, just the, the instruction that I'm going to do when someone closes their eyes is just um, to take 10 deep breaths that you count for yourself. Perfect. OK. Thank you. So close your eyes. Take 10 deep breaths, however deep feels to you. Notice the inhale, how long you inhale, how long you exhale. And just naturally, just open your eyes when the 10 are done. <coughs> All right. My, now think again about this conversation. You want to have. Does the tension feel a little different? Does it feel like something shifted? Like maybe you have just a little bit more power to choose than you did. That was just 10 breaths, right? Uh, most of you took about 25 to 30 seconds to do it. That's all it is. Um, and that's that choice between the stimulus and the response. And what I thought Krista did an amazing job last time taking you guys through is that's it, right? Pay attention to your feet. Pay attention to your breath. And neurologically, you stop the tension process. You stop the fear process. 
Now we're going to start talking about cultivating curiosity, um, and then I want to have this conversation with Jess, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, but any questions just about the review before we go forward? I spent a little bit more time on it because we have so many people who are new. So we think about stimulus and choice, and there's this space in the middle, right? Now, and I'm glad you brought up bias, because this is how it works. You have two ways you can go in that space. Either your bias is going to take you somewhere or your curiosity is going to take you somewhere. Okay? And what we know is curiosity and bias cannot coexist in your brain at the same time. If I were to say to you, I'm really curious about why you picked those genes, right? The minute I say that, my brain can't inject a bias in there, because I've told it I don't know. You can't be curious if you don't know. You can't be curious if you know. So the minute you say, I am curious about, your brain literally halts putting a bias in there. It is super cool. And I do all kinds of curiosity games with people that I have very difficult time having conversations with. I'm really curious why you, those two thoughts went together in your brain. That sounds silly, but the minute you say, I'm really curious, your brain is like, uh-huh, I want to listen to the answer, right? But if I say, those two thoughts shouldn't go together, my brain is like, yep, they shouldn't go together. That's stupid. So a bias is an automatic reaction. Um, and bias and curiosity also have a lot to do with memory. So I'm about to play a game with you guys. It's going to be really stressful for you, not for me. Um, so this is how the game goes. I'm going to tell you a story. No writing anything down, please. It's a memory story. So I'm going to tell you this story. And afterwards, I'm going to pick on a couple of you. I'm going to ask you questions about the story. And I want to see how much you can remember. I know, it's terrible. Like I said, it's going to be fun for me, not you. Um, now, do not write anything down. Try to just picture it as we're going through. Um, and because this is a collective experience, like Zena always tells us, if you get some facts wrong, I'll ask someone else, and maybe collectively we can build out the facts. So you're not in it by yourself. All right, ready? There's two kids, and they're driving in a car. They're driving 32 miles an hour in a 25 mile zone. They go six blocks at 32 miles an hour and they speed up to 37 miles an hour. At 37 miles an hour, they go for five blocks. And at the end of the five blocks, they actually speed up to 42 miles an hour. And at 42 miles an hour, after four blocks, they pass an intersection where unfortunately for them, there's two police officers sitting that they don't see. The police officers start chasing them, but the kids have the radio on in the car, and the radio is at 98% capacity. So it's so loud that the kids don't hear the sirens. So the police officers realize they have to go 53 miles an hour in order to overtake the kids so that the kids can see the, the sirens. Kids finally see the sirens, um, and the police officers indicate for them to pull over, so the kids pull over to the right, um, and the police officers search the car, and they find drugs in the trunk. OK? Everybody cool with that? <laughs> All right. Raise your hand if you saw two boys in the car. If you saw two boys, if you imagine two boys in the car. Raise your hand if you imagine two girls. Raise your hand if you imagined a boy and a girl. All right, raise your hand if it was daytime. Raise your hand if it was nighttime. Raise your hand if it was an urban environment. Raise your hand if it was a suburban environment. Raise your hand if it was rural. OK, rural. I don't say the word rural very well. <laughs> I've had this feedback. I'm working on it. Um, I don't know if it's an unconscious thing there. Um, now, how many of you saw two female cops in the car? How many saw two male cops? Now, how many of you heard jazz playing in the background when I said 98%? What did you hear? Hip-hop, rap, what else? 
rock, metal, okay? Now here's the thing that reveals the most about you. <laughs> what kind of drugs did you see in the car? How many of you saw a leafy substance of some sort in some form? <laughs> All right, how many saw a white powdery substance of some form? You don't have to know names. All right, how many saw pills? How many saw meth? That's an Iowa thing. I did this in an Iowa high school and everybody saw meth, they didn't see anything else. Um, so, I didn't tell you any of that. And that's how bias works, right? That's exactly how bias works. Yes? And that's okay. 20, yeah. 20 percent. I'm going to get to that. So about 20 percent of the population, about 20 percent of the population, anywhere from 10 to 20 percent of the population doesn't actually see images. But the overwhelming majority of us do, right? And you can imagine what some of this can play out. And one of the reasons I give you all those numbers, by the way, I don't even know what numbers I said. I change them every time. <laughs> Shit. The minute, exactly, the minute I give you numbers, your brain is going to start chasing the numbers. Because if I tell you it's a memory test, you have another bias in operation. And that bias is, for whatever reason, most of you decided I was going to ask you about the numbers, yeah. right? And so we actually do this exercise with judges. I do a lot of work with judges. Because we want to show them. So the way that I do it with judges is a little different. Um, we actually tell them the story, and we give them like a 10-minute break. And then they come back, and we ask them to tell us what story they heard. To what, we actually ask them to relate it. And then we let them hear the two versions. And the reason that that's important is because we want them to understand how much they're hearing and how much they're seeing that's not there. So what do they see when someone says defendant? What do they see when someone says truant? What do they see when someone says homeless? And we can't help but have images. And they're trying to follow the facts. And what we know is our brains are going to just populate, just like we populate people when we hear their voices on the phone. That's all that bias is. You can't not do that, right? But something as simple as after you hear a story, right, if you become curious, at the end of a story you say, now tell me about the people in the car. What music was playing? Like every single thing that you heard, if you become curious about it, you're actually interrupting any information that your bias puts. Right? And so this happens with our children, it happens with best friends, it happens with spouses. We hear stories and your brain doesn't know how to see words. Some people do. And we know that people who are very artistically inclined, I don't know if you are, but artistically inclined people actually tend to not see, um, not populate it with bias as much. Um, extremely artistically inclined people. So that's how it works. Stimulus, I told you a story, right? Between stimulus and the choice. If I had asked you, what should the punishment for the kids have been? You would have pictured yourself punishing two boys who were listening to rap or rock, who had whatever drug of choice you had in the car, right? And the drugs vary regionally. So in California, big bales of leafy substance are more likely to be seen. As I mentioned, in Iowa, people see meth. In New York, people see white powder. In Florida, they see white powder. In Chicago, we have a very diverse mix of drugs <laughs> that we see, which I believe has a lot to do with, you know, we're the center of the country, so we get all of it. Um, but it is that simple. What images are around you? What do you hear? What do you see? And so when someone says drugs, and then the drug changes if we say they found drugs in the console versus in the trunk. Your mind will see a different drug, right? Um, if I don't mention the music, people are more likely to see girls. We can literally manipulate because we know what images are out there. We can manipulate what you're going to see and hear 
simply by deciding what stories to tell and how we tell them. So, I know that's not fun when you realize that. Um, and that's sort of what advertising is based on. What information can I leave out because I know how you'll populate it? And what information can I present to maybe strengthen a particular bias that you have, right? And we know all these biases. So the goal of having courageous conversations is not about getting rid of bias. That doesn't even make any sense. It's about recognizing that you're going to have all these thoughts as you hear stories. And then just saying, I'm going to get really good at interrupting the stories with curiosity, right? So another way to think about it is curiosity and judgment. Um, there was a young, um, I think he's seven or eight years old, who drew this. I've always loved it. I'm trying to figure out um, exactly who it is so I can um, put, the, um, put the credit. But um, when, after he learned about bias, et cetera, he drew this. So it's a switch, right? It's literally what it is. You can go judgment or curiosity. And if you flip the switch and you're in curiosity, you're open to listening. The switch the flip down, you go into judgment. Your biases will give you tons of judgments for your stories. Um, and so it, I don't mean to oversimplify it or minimize it, but it can be that simply mechanical in terms of how our brain works. Okay? All right. Come on up, Jess. <laughs> I'm so proud of you for doing this. Okay. Thanks. So I asked Jess to volunteer. So I don't know if that's volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> I was put on the spot. Thank you. Um, By a lot of people on our team. <laughs> yes. So I said, has there been a courageous conversation that you've had to have? And can we actually go through it in front of everyone? Right? Um, so that you can see how some of these principles would actually affect how a person would go through the conversation. So we have talked about the conversation, um, but we're also leaving a lot of room for Jess to go wherever she needs to go with it. Crying. I'm going to be crying. <laughs> Do you have tissue? I'm, ki I'm kind of kidding. I'm kind of kidding. I was too. <laughs> um, but it's important to know, um, as we go through this story, um, as Jess talks, this isn't clean. It's not neat. It's not linear. Right? It's not a laboratory. Having courageous conversations is one of the messiest things that you can do. So um, we'll just jump in. All right? Yes. So, so when Erin and I started to talk, she's like, OK, well, tell me about the courageous conversation that you've had that you want to talk about. And I said, well, I don't know that I've had the courageous conversation, or the story that I want to tell is about having a courageous conversation, because frankly, I utterly failed at having a courageous conversation. You didn't fail totally. That's how it felt. OK. So let's start with what was the stimulus, right? We're talking about stimulus and choice. Okay. So what was the stimulus that led to um, the context in which the need for a courageous conversation arose. So, like you spoke about earlier tonight, um, it was the election, and it was with. What year was the election? It was 2016. Was it was that election. I'm sorry, the 2016 election, um, and um, and it didn't go the way that I had hoped it was going to go. So let's just put that out there, okay? Um, and. The, the day after, I had to go in to work, and I work with my family. And my family, uh, a good handful of them, and I do not see eye to eye politically. And, um, and when I walked in, I was, I was, I was really uh, very, very upset, OK? And I was shocked by my, how upset I was. And I, and I was also scared about going into work um, and having to have a, um, a meeting with um, family members that um, I knew were actually really thrilled with the outcome. And um, so I walked in very... What were you scared about? Um, well, what, a few things that were brought up for me during that experience was that um, our family 
um, are very close. This is one side of my family. The other side's close too, but I'm specific about one side of my family tonight. Um, we are in relationship with one another all the time because we have a multi-generational family business. And a lot of what I have been raised uh, within and that understanding of responsibility is really um, centered around values uh, that we share as a family. And um, when the election occurred and the result happened opposite of what I had hoped, it, I suddenly started to think about what that meant. And I was genuinely, genuinely afraid. Um, and so when I went in there, I was afraid of what I was going to um, encounter. I was afraid of how I suddenly saw my family, and not necessarily correctly, but I suddenly saw my family members very differently than I had seen them before. I jumped to a real fast conclusion of what that meant. Um, I was afraid that I was not gonna like them anymore. I was afraid that they wouldn't understand my fear. Um, what else? You're I was afraid I was gonna lose it. <laughs> you were also, um, when we talked, you also talked about not just your fears um, with your family, but just fears about our country and about the world. There were a lot of other fears that you were bringing in. Absolutely, and that was what I meant with my first fear, was I was genuinely afraid because um, I have these two young boys and the way I, I had perceived the result, I, I didn't feel it was the right direction for our country, and I didn't feel it was the right direction for my children, and, so, um, and for many other people. And so I was very afraid about what, the, um, what that would mean for our, for our nation. I, I really was, I was genuinely scared. So we had the stimulus of election results. And as we, we keep talking about, like, between stimulus and response. And as you were processing this, fear hijacked your brain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly it was, you were just scared of all these things. Um, and so what happened when you started talking to your family? So, yeah, I think, I think the reason why I decided that I wanted to talk to my family was because I was... Um, I wanted to reconcile why, if we shared similar values, we were demonstrating them very differently through this particular avenue. And I really, I really wanted to talk about it. And this is not something that our family necessarily talks about. Like politics is kind of a jokey, jokey type of thing to a certain point. Like if we don't agree, let's just kind of joke about it and tease each other about it and then move on. But for me, I was no longer at this position where it was funny. Um, and um, I kind of lost my train of thought there. So I, I wanted did, to have the so conversation. How did that conversation go? Yeah, about day? like, how did we get here? And how come we're not seeing this whole everything the same way? Which is really kind of naive of me to even think that. But anyway, that's what I wanted to, that's the conversation I wanted to have with my family. And what actually happened? I yelled at my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> How I, badly I, did you yell? Oh, I was crying. Um, I was angry. I blamed her for everything. <laughs> everything. It was her fault. The whole damn thing. That's a lot of power. <laughs> it is a lot of power, but clearly I hold her to high esteem. <laughs> She, she's a very important person in my life. Um, so you blew up at your cousin. I did, yes. And then what happened? Um, she was taken aback. She was offended. I felt horrible and sick to my stomach. And um, I walked away and she walked away. And we had a cooling off period. Okay. And then? And then we decided as a family that we needed to talk about this as a family, and we brought in a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> we brought in a consultant to remind us that um, we, despite our different views, 
we still love each other and we're still really on the same team. Um, that worked for them. It didn't really work for me. I was still like, gosh darn it, I want to get into issues with you, <laughs> right? I was really like, no, we need to have some serious conversations. But also while that was going on, um, I learned more about my cousin and her journey, about learning about some of the issues that I felt very strongly about and where she was in that process. And that How opened my eyes a little that, bit. How did you right? Because you've blown up at her, and now you've had this consultant come in and how did you learn? How did those conversations occur? Well, okay, so in my family, you know, I'm not the boss. So oftentimes I'm put in a position where I have really strong opinions and then I get pushed back and either I like really bear down and, and, and lean into my pushback or I, I start to question myself a little bit and and so that started to happen, not just because I needed to start questioning myself, but I loved my cousin. And my anger and frustration that I had created for myself around this relationship um, was, was hurting me deeply. And I decided that I would rather lean into the love side of it than, than lean into the anger um, because to me, at the end of the day, the relationship was more um, valuable to me than holding on to the anger. Even if I felt like I was valid in my anger, it, it really canceled it out. And when you mentioned your story, we talked about this conflicting value, right? Like when fear and wanting to be open-minded conflicted with each other. And what happened with you too is that the need to be angry and love conflicted with each other. Yes. <laughs> so you became curious about why she thought what she did, about why she believed what she did, why she held the views that she did. I did, and I also became curious about myself and about why I felt so strongly and about why my response was so extreme. And, um, and so I started to explore both of those things. And um, over time, like a lot of time, <laughs> right? Now, this does not happen in like a week where we're like, oh, okay, everything's okay, you know? It's, it's been over time. And it is like a family conversation, but it's also a conversation that we're continuously having together. So, I'm not gonna put you on the spot, but does the feeling of wanting to be angry ever go away? Yeah, well, that's a good question. Um, you know what, I kind of submitted to the feelings, I guess, a little bit of just saying, <coughs> no, I think the love part really came, came to the surface um, and sometimes I still get frustrated, but it's not anger in the same way. Because what has happened is we've been able to, we've been able to start to lean into conversation together and we're being really um, generous, I would say, with each other about how we're in relationship around these conversations. But again, that took a lot of time. And so I'll get, I will get frustrated with certain you know, um, views, but I'll also just listen. I'll really listen to them, and I will question, I'll question myself a little bit more um, now than I probably ever did. And one of the reasons I thought Jess's story was really powerful is because one of the best, right, roads out of fear is love. And it can be love for a person, um, and that is oftentimes <laughs> what it is, but it can also be love for an ideal, right? Um, I've had people have the same conversation about patriotism, for example. So it is your love for your country that can cause you to stop and be curious about why really good, kind people are doing things very differently. It can be love for inclusion. It can be love for wanting to see our children grow up in a better world, however you're defining it. And so as, um, you know, sometimes people, when you talk about love, 
Um, they're like, roll their eyes a little bit. Um, but love is a very powerful emotion and probably one of the things that is equal to fear um, in all of us. And so sometimes if when we're in these positions of fear, which is what I love about where when you said like, okay, now that love got elevated, then the fear had to go away mm -hmm. because it was more important to preserve that love mm -hmm. than it was to be right or than it was to react. So the listening started when you take a value that's equal to fear and you hold it up and you make those values conflict. We all have fear all the time, but we also have other values that are just as strong, right? And for some of us, it's love, we can tap into that easily. For others, it could be creativity, it could be art, it could be music. Um, for even others, it could be something else. But if we do that, then we can create that space. So is there anything else you want to share? I'm proud of you. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. This was, it's been a three-year journey, right? Are we in 2019 right now? Yeah. We're headed into another election cycle. <laughs> And um, here's, the, here's, I think, something that we talked a lot this morning, actually, about how this stuff is messy, and it does not get wrapped up into a tidy bow at the end where we're all like, OK, great, let's agree. This is good. Let's move forward. That's not the case. My cousin is 100% in her, you know, in her convictions, but she's listening in a way that she wasn't before. And I'm 100% still believing in the ideals that I believe in, but I'm also listening in a different way. And, and the other thing that's happening is um, <clears throat> we're trying to have more courageous conversations as a family. And we're talking about things that before we really did not take very seriously, even though we should have uh, with each other. And, um, and just a couple weeks ago, uh, she and I both attended a conference in DC called the Healthy Coalition, uh, no, the Healthy Democracy Coalition Conference together. And I, that's like a really big deal. Because let me tell you, in 2016, um, and for most of 2017, <laughs> I really didn't think that, um, I didn't think I was going to be able to get to a place where I could do that. So the change happened on both sides, but a lot of it was with me. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, and, I just, um, I just want to say again that that was very courageous for her to do. Um, and not just because, you know, she's one of the people organizing this and she's kind of got a public face to this, but also because, um, and just as you did, you know, when you put that vulnerability out there, like they were hurting everything I love. Like when that kind of thought goes through your head, to be able to step back and grow is, is very powerful. So I'm glad you guys got to hear from her and learn from her today. So um, we're going to talk about, just very quickly, right, just to kind of take all of that and summarize it, is when you have that moment of mindfulness, it can be because you took a deep breath. It could be because you stopped. It could be one way to be mindful is also to hold up another value that is really important to you, right? Um, and for me, um, I've chosen this work over, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years. Inclusion is that much of a value to me. And there are times I'm scared, whatever curse word you want to use, because I don't want to face something, right? I've done research in Idaho. Um, with white nationalist groups. I think I mentioned this guy to you guys before. And walking into the Aryan Brotherhood compound kind of confronted every fear I had, right? Because I'm like, I'm literally everything that they're saying they don't like. I'm a pretty cool person. If they meet me, like maybe, right? I don't know. <laughs> but for me, the reason I wanted to confront that fear is because I did have security, just FYI. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to confront that because it was, it's the extreme when we start thinking of inclusion, is that important to me? Do I have a right to say that this entire group of people do not get to believe what they believe? And where do I draw the line? And do I get to draw the line? 
Does someone else get to draw the line? Is the line at physical safety? Right? If it is, there's people in my family that maybe would be involved in that too. Like, all these thoughts go through your head as to like, what does inclusion mean? And the minute you start holding up those values and you become curious about the things you're scared of, you literally fade out the bias that is related to that, right? And you, the bias can't be as powerful anymore because the curiosity overpowers it. So, right, the primary thing that you wanna think about when you're having courageous conversations is I don't understand and I want to understand. Not they're wrong, not anything else. I don't understand and I wanna understand. And then you say who, what, when, why? Like, who do I want to talk to? What do I want to talk to them about? What do I want to gain? Do, do I care about this? Which one do I want to talk about? Which conversation do I want to have? Just use questions, right? And once you have those questions, if you're ready, you ask them of people. And once you have that information, you, trans you go from I don't understand and I want to understand to now that I know more, I can choose how I want to respond. And it may very well be that your initial response is still what you would choose. But the courage to question, experience curiosity, and then choose it is powerful because without that, we can't even start to think about differences, right? So your turn to think of a tough conversation that you need to have or want to have. And I want you um, to just find another partner, maybe someone different than you talked to already. Um, if you want to move around to do that um, around the table, you can. Um, but I want you to talk to them about this conversation that you want to have. Go as deep as you want, right? But we're done with the playful, superficial stuff. We're going to start going deeper. Go as deep as you want, but please use your judgment. Um, you know what you're ready for. And I just put a whole bunch of stuff up here that you can start talking about. Um, and it's really like, what I want you to talk to this other person about, because you're starting to vocalize it, are things like, what is your purpose for having this conversation? Um, you heard a lot of these questions answered in just a story. What do you hope to accomplish? What would be an ideal outcome? Right? Watch for hidden purposes. You may think you have honorable goals, only to notice that your language is excessively critical or condescending. You think you want to support, but you want to maybe punish the person. Right? Like You really want to have this conversation. It feels courageous because you want to yell at someone. Um, so what is your purpose? If you th really think about the purpose, what do you hope to accomplish? If you're not sure about the outcome, chances are that your brain wants an outlet, not really dialogue and you want to be able to tell the difference. Um, some purposes are more useful than others, right? What assumptions are you making about this person's intentions? What have you already decided about this person that you may actually not know? Um, do you, what, about, what are your feelings? Do you feel intimidated, belittled, ignored, disrespected, marginalized? Right? What is it that you're feeling that is driving you to say, I want to have this conversation? And how is that related to the outcome that you want? Um, what buttons of yours are being pushed? If you're like me, I have so many buttons. Um, and it's, but when someone pushes them, I react. But the more I learn about my buttons, the more I can choose not to. Um, are you more emotional than the situation warrants? What is your backstory in this? What are you bringing? Like, what are the, all the other stories that you think are going to be solved with this conversation? Um, what personal history is being triggered? Um, and once you recognize what personal history is being triggered, go back, what's the outcome, right? Um, how is your attitude influencing your perception of it? If you think this is gonna be horrible, dif horribly difficult, it's probably gonna be horribly difficult. Um, what good do you think can come out of it? Uh, who is the opponent? Usually when we start thinking about a courageous conversation, we think in terms of opponents, right? Who is the opponent? What might he or she be thinking about the situation? Is this really an opponent or a partner? Right? And, or maybe it's still an opponent. Or maybe it's an opponent that's not going to become a partner tomorrow, but maybe in the future. Maybe this is someone you want to be your partner. Um, 
How are, you know, what are your needs and fears? Are there any common concerns? Could there be? How have you contributed to this problem? Right? How is the other person? These are just some questions. Right? You can have a ton more. Right? Like, is Saturday a good day? Right? Um, should we be drinking when we do this? I don't know. Like, there could be a lot of questions that you have that are unique to your situation. But what these really take you through is why do you want to have this conversation? What is the purpose? What is the outcome? Right? And is it really courageous? Or are you just trying to vent? Are you trying to feel better? What is your goal? Why? So I want you to think of a tough conversation that you want to have. And I want you to turn to a partner at the table and go through some of these. Again, we don't videotape right, during the table conversations. Be brave. Um, sometimes when we think of these things in our own head, we have very different thoughts than when we hear it say out loud. Like when we're saying things out loud, we're like, oh, wow, that sounds so different than it sounded in my head. So I want you to just experience going through this process with another person. If the person you're sitting next to is someone you know really, really well, it's OK to switch, because that might make it harder. right? Also, don't, when the other person is talking through, if you know the person, don't answer questions for them. Don't be like, oh no, what you really want to do is this. Like, <laughs> that's not what we want to do. I get that you love each other. I get that you all are friends. But this is about someone's journey and figuring it out. It's great that you have opinions. But we really want to, those to be inside thoughts for today. OK? Um, so don't answer their questions. Just keep asking more questions. If, if they say, I don't know, do I want to be their partner? Well, what would make you, who are partners? Just whatever comes to mind. We don't want this to be um, prescriptive, necessarily. But just be in that space. And give it about 10 minutes for you guys to just talk to each other about it. Just take a deep breath, let it out. I would like you to actually turn to the person or people. I saw some of y'all just do group things. And just say, thank you for having that conversation with me. Um, So part of, you know, part of um, courage is gratitude, too, um, when people give us the space to be courageous. And we also want to be super grateful for it. Um, and so I want you to keep this in mind. And I want to tell you a story. I just want you to keep in mind, because I think it was, it's just, I, I'm a researcher. I experiment on my kids all the time. Um, <laughs> but there was one story that has always stuck with me as sort of the power of curiosity versus bias. So um, I'm a huge Black Hawks fan. And so is my son. And so is my daughter, my husband. And um, we went through in, in, you know, when we were winning um, back in the day. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, very exciting. I used to wear Black Hawks gear. I don't right now, but it's there. Um, so we went to New York. Um, we took a family trip to New York. And um, the New York Rangers were playing Pittsburgh. And my son said, oh my god, I want to go. I want to see Sidney Crosby. Right? And I said, of course. And these are really expensive tickets, by the way. I said, all right. So we all got, you know, we had our Blackhawks gear. Um, we wore our Blackhawks gear. And we go to Madison Square Garden. Um, and we walked there, because we stayed in Times Square. We're super excited. Um, it happened to also be the weekend that we saw Hamilton. And so it was like, oh, Hamilton hockey, like, perfect weekend <laughs> ever, like, right? So um, we had seen Hamilton. Now we're going to this New York Pittsburgh game. And we walk in, and we start looking around and realizing we are the only people of color going in. And um, there was an older white gentleman who, in all, I'm sure from like the best of intentions, came up to me and my son, because we were the most geeked out in, in Hawks gear. And he said, you know, the Knicks don't play tonight. And I said, their tickets are cheaper than this, so they better not play tonight, because <laughs> these were actually expensive tickets. And 
He said, it's a hockey game tonight. <laughs> and my son, who um, wasn't kind of realizing, like my husband and I are looking at each other like, well, what do we do now? But my son was like, I know it's a hockey game. I came to see Sidney Crosby. And just starts talking about who he likes and why he's there and all of this stuff. And coincidence of coincidences, this gentleman actually didn't sit, wasn't sitting that far from us. By the end of the night, m this gentleman's friend and my son switched seats <laughs> because they became, they were so curious. And he was curious about my son. My son was curious about him. They both shared hockey. Um, we won't talk about the fact that I now had a stranger sitting next to me that I didn't consent to. <laughs> but by the end of the game, what you could see is how much this gentleman's mind had been opened. Um, he, you know, Miles talked about, my son talked about Chicago. This man talked about Pittsburgh. He was from Pittsburgh, so neither one was from there. Um, and it was just, it's a story that's always stuck with me because it started with bias, right? But it also started with bias that, was, that had no malice to it, right? Um, so it felt a way to us, but for him, he was being helpful, <laughs> right? Because what could be worse than if you wanted to watch the Knicks and like there was ice when you walked in, like, right? That would be very shocking. So, but it was bias. And so where he was coming from, how the adults took it, and then how my son took it, and how curiosity just completely changed the dynamic. And they talked about everything under the sun. Um, and you know, when he gave Miles a hug when we were leaving, um, and I asked Miles on the way back home, um, I mean, on the way back to the hotel, I said, so what did you think about that? He goes, that's so weird that he would think we were there for the Knicks, like the Knicks suck. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, but when you listen to that story, right, it really encapsulates how all these things are going on and we're all perceiving it from our perspectives. So my first thought was, how do I explain what's going on to my kids? Like, I don't know, like, is this, should I be worried? Um, and my son took it like, that's a stupid question. And then they started, to, so that is just an example. And how many stories like that do we have where maybe somebody wasn't curious and people walked away? And maybe the gentleman would have thought, how rude, like I was trying to be helpful. And we thought, how could he not understand that that was offensive? And neither was actually true. Right? And so just a quick story about bias, places that bias can come from, um, and also how curiosity can turn around and turn, pretty much turn into some really curious relationships that you would not see otherwise. So I want you to make a commitment. Right? Um, today's November 13th. You have a few days left in November. And chances are many of us are going to see some family members <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm not suggesting the conversation has to be. But um, we've talked about the theory of fear. We've talked about mindfulness. We've talked about today about curiosity. The next step is doing, right? Um, and really important to remember when you're doing, you're not going to get it right. It's going to be awkward. Um, it is going, you're going to feel like you're stumbling. You may start and um, as Jess so bravely shared with us, you may react and back up. You don't know how it's going to go. Um, it's not a laboratory situation, but I do want you to commit to having one courageous conversation in November. It doesn't have to be the most courageous conversation <laughs> that you need to have. It could be maybe in your workplace, somebody that, you've just needing, that you're needing to say something to. Um, it could be maybe with a friend. Um, and you know, you finally admit that the movies that they make you watch you've never liked. I don't know, whatever it is. <laughs> it can be innocent and it can be far more serious. The goal is find something that you haven't, you've been wanting to say but haven't said. 
and take everything that we've practiced. What, are, what is scaring you? Why are you afraid? How can you practice courage? How can mindfulness help you? How can these questions help you? How can the conversation you had with your table mate today? How can that help you think it through? How can you plan it? When will you do it, right? All of that, and then I think just really make the commitment and do it. Um, so I can't hold you accountable for it, um, but maybe if you're really scared that you won't do it, find someone at your table and say, can we be in touch? Can you hold me accountable? Can I email you or text you on November 30th and say, um, I did it, I had this conversation, right? Um, when you make this commitment to have this conversation, um, I think this was a really good lead into it, is one of the things we don't understand, and Krista talked about it last time, is think about someone else's needs. Right? Think about why they have the emotions that they do, what they're worried about. Um, and we're all going to have these biases, and they're not going to go anywhere. Um, but you know, um, this goes back to sort of what Jess was talking about. In um, Chinese medicine, they have something called a healing crisis, where um, you start, you, you, you find something that's wrong, and you start healing it, and then it gets really bad for a while, right? And you wonder, like, if the medicine's working, because you're actually sicker than you were when you started. And then suddenly, on the other side, you're so much better. And so when we say we're going to delve into these, um, what we're delving into is some pain, and we're going to get sicker before we get better. Right? So there's going to be moments when you're going to be like, why did I listen to any of them? Why did I start this? Like, I was so good. I didn't need to do this. And yes, but the other side of it is so beautiful, but we can't, we don't have any way of getting there without the tears and the hearing each other's stories and making space for other people's fears um, and their emotions and their love and all of that. So um, as Zena mentioned in the very beginning, the first three sessions were going inward, right? And with this last dialogue, we're pushing it outward. We're starting to talk about it. And this commitment puts you out there. Um, and so practice it. Um, I wish you all the best. I'm so grateful to have been a part of this small part of your journey. Um, so I'm going to have Zena come up and close this out. So thank you all very much. Erin, Dr. Reeves has been with us all three sessions. Uh, and Krista Robinson-Lyles has been with us for the two. Would you just thank them again for their... <laughs> I appreciate that. In January of two, 2019, um, uh, a dear woman named Lauren Hood and Claire and Jess and I met in New Orleans and literally this was the book that I started taking my notes in. This is page one and it says let people be in their feelings both as they criticize, struggle, process, cry and listen. Do not seek to be saviors. It's not our job to go and help the other one move through their pain but it is our job to bear witness, to tell our own truths, and to stand and learn and be humbled by what we see. This night has invited those whose our hearts and ears and eyes are open to bear witness. And a witness can only tell the truth. So the only truth that we are allowed to go out of here and tell is our own. What did you experience tonight? What is not Stacy's truth? What is your truth? As you hear Stacy's story, as you hear our sister's story, as you hear Dr. Reeves share, what's your truth from tonight? It might be, I have so much to learn. It might be, I don't even know what to be curious about. It might be, I need to go back and read The Velveteen Rabbit. <laughs> it might be just to be still 
and see, I would say God, but in this moment I'll say, see what the universe says to you about a next step. Beloved, don't rush this. Bear witness to what is rising up for you and have coffee with somebody that's in this room and continue the conversation. Have coffee, or I do think bourbon is also on that list. <laughs> and be curious. Because if we will start that, we interrupt the bias. What a gift of honesty. What a gift of bearing witness. This morning, Claire, Jess, and I were at a conference called Upswell. And, and Julie, where are you, Julie? Julie was there as well. And uh, we sat again on a stage with Krista Tippett. And I want you to hear what she said about you. She said, she talked about this Barrington experiment and she bragged about you and she said she wanted to stay in touch with us because we were her teachers so know that the work that you're doing in this space will in fact change the world but it only happens as it changes us go from this place confident that nothing is wasted Go from this place confident that what you take in is for you and will be generative if we will be curious. Go and practice. Go and be who you are called to be. And that is a living, breathing, growing, transforming human soul. Be well.